Good afternoon. Welcome to CFP Board's webinar CE, titled CE Sponsor Program Back to Basics. We're pleased to be able to virtually convene with you to provide a primer on important aspects of the CE Sponsor Program. My name is Michelle Weatherall. I am part of CFP Board's Executive Leadership Team and oversee CFP Board's education program as well as our examinations area and human resources. I've been working with CFP Board for over a year as a consultant in several education and examination functions and was appointed to the current position this past summer. My background includes positions in the fields of law, human resources, as well as the chief staff executive for a nonprofit association and foundation. I'd like to introduce Vanessa Williamson, our continuing education manager. She holds a nonprofit management executive certificate from the Georgetown University Center for Public and Nonprofit Leadership and is a certified association executive through the American Society of Association Executives. Co-presenting with Vanessa today is Christy Callaway. Christy is our senior continuing education administrator, and she's likely known to many of you as our point of contact for attendance reports, or to use our informal lingo, batches. During today's webinar, all of you in the audience are invited to use the question and answer function on the right side of the screen to ask questions of us. You may submit your question at any time during this program. We will try to address as many questions as possible during a Q&A session at the end of the program. If we don't get to your question today, we will post the questions and CFP Board's responses on the CFP Board's website. We'll also post a PDF copy of the slide presentation for those of you who may wish to print a set of slides for your ongoing reference. Here we have the agenda for today's presentation. We have a lot of information to get through. And because we're hoping to provide you with basic information, we won't go into a great de deal of detail on all of these items. Our hope is to familiarize you with processes and to give you some resources for future use. In particular, we'll have URLs for web pages where you can follow up at your convenience to review material covered during today's presentation. The topics, logging in, contact information changes, program applications, attendance reports, use of CFP Board's trademarks, CFP Board ethics CE program requirements, and finally, topics and topic exclusions. Before we go into the core of today's presentation, I will take a couple of minutes to provide you with some information about CFP Board's mission, strategic plan, and education objectives. For any of today's participants who were a part of our October 23rd program, this will be a repeat of information shared during that presentation. The CFP Board mission is listed. And I won't read that um, in detail. As you can see from this slide, education plays a key role in CFP Board's strategic plan. It is one of the organization's core pillars. The core ed education objectives are first to establish and enforce educational standards for enhancing the knowledge, skills, and abilities of current and potential CFP certificates. Second, ensure the delivery of quality continuing education programs. 
And now I'll turn the program over to Vanessa. Thank you, Michelle, and hello, everyone. I'll kick things off this afternoon by running through the process to log in to a CE sponsor online account. For today's program, just note we'll be using a lot of screenshots to show you images of what, of what you can expect to see when you go online. And I created the screenshots from my PC in my office in the hopes of giving you a sense of what you'll see when you're sitting at your computer in your office. This slide that you're looking at now is a snapshot of CFP Board's homepage. Um, and the first thing that we're going to talk about is logging into the online account. And if you'll note, there's a red circle surrounding a gray area called Login to your online CFP Board account. From here, certificates can get into their secure account to make online credit card payments, register with CFP Board, submit program applications, review status of invoices, and more. When you want to log into your online, on a, on a, online account, excuse me, you'll click on this toolbar. After clicking on the toolbar, you'll see this page. Note the area with the red arrow called Continuing Education Sponsors. If you click into Login in this particular area, you'll be taken to our next screenshot, which is the CE Sponsor Login page. At this point, just follow the login prompt, enter the CE Sponsor email address and password. And if you're new to your job and you don't know the sponsor email address or the password information, just send an email to the CE Sponsor mailbox, and a member of our team will work with you to get that information to you. But for the purposes of today's program, we're assuming that we know the online info, the login information. So we've entered the email address and the password. And we'll click Go. And it'll take us to this welcome page. From this welcome page, you can do a number of things. Check the latest CE sponsor news, review programs, submit program applications. For the purposes of today's session, we'll focus on submitting a program application. And for CFP Board, the preferred process for program application submissions is online. Any applications that we receive in fax, PDF, or hard copy format will incur a manual processing fee of $25 per application. This manual processing fee went into effect on January 1, 2010. To submit a program application, click on Go Under Manage Your CE Programs. Use this process for submitting all program applications, whether it's an application for an individual one-off presentation or several applications for sessions which are part of a conference. Remember that all conference sessions must be submitted in individual program applications. Each session will be reviewed individually. For example, if you're hosting a two-hour presentation on Roth IRA conversions, you'll submit one program application for the two-hour session. If you're hosting a six-hour conference with three two-hour sessions, the first one being a two-hour program on Roth IRA conversions, a two-hour session on tax changes in tax law, followed by a two-hour session on estate planning, you would need to submit three individual program applications, one for each two-hour session. So at this point, we'll assume that you've got your program planned and you're ready to submit an application to CFP Board to get the program accepted for CE hours. Note that in order to market your presentations as accepted by CFP Board for continuing education credit, you'll want to submit the program application in advance of your event. And here I'll take a moment to answer a question a participant asked in advance of today's presentation. They asked if all programs need to be pre-approved by CFP Board. I'll say first that we generally say that programs are accepted by CFP Board rather than approved. And for your marketing purposes, if you want to be able to market to certificates that your programs are accepted for CFP Board credit, you'll want to make sure that you get that application in in advance of your program. But on occasion, people do submit applications after an event has been held, and we do accept those applications. However, for these late applications, there is a $75 per application late fee. Now back to our online application for a program that we want to submit. You'll, you'll click on Go 
under Manager CE Programs. It's circled in red on the screen. After clicking Go and Manage Your Account, you'll see this page. From this page, this is really, really where you get into the options of adding a new program, viewing active programs, and viewing expired programs. For today, since we want to add a new program, you'll click on the area on the link called Add a New Program, which is again circled in red. This next screen is an important one because it covers some of the legal and program requirements. It reviews CE sponsored program application requirements regarding program content, and the same language appears in the CE sponsor agreement. Here I'll answer another question that we received, and the question is about how a program is accepted. And what I can say is that CFP board outlines the criteria for live internet and self-study programs and the CE sponsor agreement all of our sponsors sign when they first register with CFP board. The, the basic criteria is that programs need to be at least 50 minutes of instruction for the initial hour of education. Once that initial hour is completed, you can provide incremental hours of continuing ed. Um, programs that are 30 minutes or 45 minutes, we will not accept. The programs do need to connect to one of CFP Board's 89 topics and or addendum, and they need to be created and taught by a qualified individual or individuals. Self-study programs, the distance learning style programs, require tests. And this requirement is a minimum of 10 test questions per continuing education hour. When our staff reviews a program, we ask, how does the program improve the financial planner's ability to provide services to a client or clients? Keep this in mind as you're considering submitting a program application. Again, the criteria is listed in the CE Sponsor Agreement, and the 89 topics and topic addendum are listed in the booklet CFP Certification, Policies, Renewal, Requirements, and Continuing Education Standards. I'll have a, a link to this later on in the program so that you can easily access this information. Um, but both of these items are publicly accessible on CFP Board's website. Now, back to our online process. After you've car carefully reviewed the program requirements and you've considered your program and you feel confident that it meets CFP Board's requirements, you'll click the Acknowledgement box and then you'll click on Save. The application process will then take you to a blank online application form. And at this time, you'll enter in the details in the field. This is basic information about the title, the program ID, and you'll provide a brief description of up to 400 characters. Note here that the description box accepts up to 400 characters. This is an increase of 100 characters um, from the 300 that were allowed last year. And we put this into effect on January 1st. About the program description, this is a key element to the program application. Please be brief and be clear about the content of the presentation. Our staff will be reviewing the program descriptions, and if the description is incomplete, the application will be flagged and denied. We will contact you to ask for more details, but not having a clear, concise program description will delay acceptance of your program. This is also where we might have concerns about whether or not the topic that you're discussing in the presentation meets CFP Board's topic requirements. And as Michelle outlined in our agenda, we will discuss the topics in a little more detail later on in the presentation. Also note that you don't need to copy and paste a session description verbatim from what you're using in your advertising materials. We're happy with the, the gist of the session, and we certainly are happy if you feel free to paraphrase the information. Note that we don't need the uh, presenter's names or their credentials, and this may save you space in this description field, allowing you to provide more information about the pre presentation content itself. Now, once you've completed all of these fields, you'll simply click Save at the bottom of the screen. After clicking Save, you're presented with a basic outline of the program information submitted. This screen shows fake information I created for today for the purposes of today's program. So my sponsor name is Vanessa Williamson Test. My program name is Test Program 1. I've got a red circle highlighting another item of importance. At the bottom of the screen, 
you'll see a, a link called Program Offerings. And this is something that's important because it lets you enter in more information about dates and locations of presentations. This is tied to our policy change in which we accept a program for a calendar year and you can offer that same presentation over and over and over again. So for example, if you're offering a presentation in March, July, and September, we'll want to know that information and so you'll click on program offerings. And you'll see this type of a page come up. <coughs> this is where you add the individual dates and locations of different conference or uh, presentation dates and locations around the country throughout the year. For example, if you host a two-hour presentation on Roth IRAs in March and it's a huge success and you decide that you want to add another session of that same program in June, you'd be able to add the June date by clicking on the Add Program Offering link and completing the field on this page. For our part, this information is required to ensure accurate attendance report processing for students who take your class on the different dates throughout the year. And this screen is actually a work in progress. So soon when you go to the screen to add date and location information, you'll see text which provides a reminder as to the purpose of this offerings area and guidance on how to complete it. But the fields are fairly self-explanatory, allowing you to add additional date and location information for your program. Once you add a new date and location for a program, you'd click Save. But before I move on, I do want to address another question that's come in, and it's in regards to the CE Sponsor Program changes I've mentioned several times. On January 1st, 2010, CFP Board implemented policy changes to the CE Sponsor Program. We announced the changes via email to our CE Sponsor contacts on September 21st, 2009, and we hosted a webinar on October 23rd, 2009 to discuss the policy changes in more detail. The webinar was a 90-minute program and it covered a lot of information. Unfortunately, because we've got 60 minutes today and quite a lot to get through, I'm not able to go into to detail on the new program changes, but we do have a recording of our October 23rd webinar available on CFP Board's website for those of you who want more information about those changes. We also have information about the program changes on the website in the form of a grid, which provides an overview. And of course, you can always call the CE sponsor staff for more information. After you click Save on the additional program information, it'll be added to your program record. You can then click on the Add Additional add additional offerings link if you have another date and location to add. I think I've actually kind of covered that already, but I think on the screen you see the add additional offerings link, and basically my point here is that I want to let you know that you can continue to add offerings over and, and over and over again as the dates and locations become accessible to you. Um, you're welcome to add this information when you initially submit your program application, but if you decide throughout the year to add additional dates, you've got that flexibility to do, so, to do so at your convenience. And at the time that you do decide to add a program offering, I've circled in the middle of the screen this View Active Programs area because you wouldn't be adding a new program at this time, you would click on this particular link to take you to an already set up program record to add date uh, and program in, uh, date and location information for future offerings for a program for, an for which an application had already been submitted and accepted. Going back to the screenshot of the program application, uh, after you've completed the program application field and the program's been submitted, you can, you'll can you see text which confirms that the application has been received by CFP Board. Um, I just want to let you know that CFP Board is taking up to seven business days to review applications as they come in. You'll get a confirmation that tells you that we've received the application, that your application is in a pending status, 
and that will contact you within seven business days in regards to program acceptance and payment. Subsequent to that confirmation, you'll receive an email from the CE sponsor staff to alert you when your program application's invoice is available for payment. The invoice will be posted to your secure online account for credit card payment. But again, the response time to all online program applications may take up to seven business days. Our team makes our best effort to get applications processed in less time, but we do have a seven business day turnaround. Know that once the application is submitted, your company will be billed for the number of hours requested in the application. This means that if you submit a program application for a three-hour presentation but only two hours are accepted, you will pay for three hours. This happens from time to time, particularly in instances in which a program focuses on the nuts and bolts of a topic and then spends time focusing on how to market the financial planner in connection to that topic. Like say a presentation spends two hours talking about estate planning updates and then spends one hour talking about how to find clients in this market, we would provide two hours of credit for this, but we would not provide one hour of credit for the marketing portion of this, the presentation. All applications are billed regardless of whether the program is accepted or denied. This is because the CE sponsor staff processes all applications that are received. This is where an understanding of topic requirements really comes into play, and as promised, we'll discuss the requirements in more detail in a bit. But for now, we've completed a quick run-through of the online application process and the steps to add program offerings. So with that, I will move on to changes to contact information. CFP Board recognizes one main point of contact for your organization. We get emails and attendance reports from more than one person, but for our records, we have one person identified as your company's CE sponsor contact. That's the person who gets the emails from the CE sponsor staff about webinars, program changes, billing, etc. And we know the reality of today's workplace is that the main point of contact may change, which means that at some point, all CE sponsors will need to update their contact information. And this is an easy one. CE sponsors are only able to change the email address online. After you log in to your secure CE sponsor account um, and you're taken to that welcome page, you'll see in the circled area, update and edit your organization's online, uh, your organization's contact information. You would click on this area to update the email address, but for other updates, uh, say it's the person's name or your mailing address, those sorts of things, we would ask that you send a, an email to the CE sponsor staff at the email noted on the screen to provide this information, and then our team will make those updates for you. Now, at this point, you've seen a quick run through of the steps to take in advance of a program. I'll now turn the presentation over to Christy, and Christy will walk you through what, what what you need to do once the event is over and you want to report hours for your certificate attendees. Thank you, Vanessa. Good afternoon. This part of today's presentation is intended to be a tutorial for sponsors on how to report CE hours using the Excel template provided by the CFP board. We'll review what form is to be used to report CE and how to fill this form out. We'll also go over how to avoid some of the common mistakes that often cause processing delays. Okay, here's what your Excel form looks like. You can find this form by going to www.cfp.net and navigating to the Continuing Education Sponsor page. Once on this page, you'll see a link for instructions on electronically reporting CE. On the following page, the template is available for you to download. The template consists of a header record and a body. The header record allows the CFP board to validate the data correctly and ensure that no data is duplicated or omitted. Um, the header record, record must be completed in its entirety for proper processing. The body area is for the listing of individuals and the courses they have completed. Each course must be listed individually, even when reporting multiple courses for the same individual. The first cell to fill in is your CE sponsor code number. This is a two to four digit number assigned to you by the CFP board and should not change. 
If you aren't sure what this number is, just give us a call and we can help find it for you. The next box is for your sponsor name. This is the name of your organization and should exactly match the CFP board records. Please do not enter this any differently than it is registered with the CFP board. If you're unsure of how to enter this, just log into your account and enter the organization name as it appears on your account. When this cell is not filled out correctly, it may sometimes cause a delay in processing. If a name change occurs, be sure to notify the CFP board by sending an email to the CE sponsor staff before submitting reports under the new name. The next cell is the sponsor batch date. This is the date you're creating and sending in the report, not to be confused with the date the program was completed. The sponsor's batch date should be the date the report is emailed to the CFP board. Next, we have the sponsor batch number. This is a number that increases sequentially for each report submitted. This number and the date are used to make sure that a duplicate report is not being processed, and also to make sure we haven't missed a report. When we receive a report in which the batch number is out of order, you'll probably receive an email from us asking you to check your records and verify the batch number. Please be patient with our request because our system will not allow us to process any batches out of order. The number of records is the next cell. This is the total number of records the report contains. Another way to think of this is that the number of records is the total number of rows filled in once the report is complete. Once the header record has been completed, you can begin entering the individual and course information in the body. Enter the first record to be reported on the first empty row of the body. Each course being reported must have its own row, even when reporting multiple courses from one individual. Also, do not leave any empty rows. Um, please don't use ditto marks or leave cells blank, as this also causes a delay in processing time. The CE Sponsor Program ID number should be a unique alphanumeric value identifying the course completed and should not change over time. This number will appear on the spreadsheet exactly as it, as it is registered with the CFP board. You can log into your account with the CFP board to verify the information. The program name should be the title of the course that was completed and should exactly match the title in the CFP board's database. Again, it is important that this, this information is current, accurate, and exact. Please do not change the title from the way it is registered with the CFP board. If a program name or ID is different on the spreadsheet than what the CFP board has on record, then an error occurs which could cause the wrong programs to be assigned to the CFP certificates on the report. So making sure that this information is correct includes all capitalization, abbreviations, spacing, and symbols that may be used in the title. The next cell is the date the individual completed um, course. This should be the date the course was completed. Please make sure that this information is accurate as the date entered in this field does determine when the certificate gets credit for the course. If the date is entered incorrectly, the program could be assigned to the wrong certification period, which could really impact the certification renewal for the certificate affected. There is no way to undo a process batch, so it's important to verify this date before sending in the report. Please do not leave these cells blank, as we can't process a batch when the area is not completed. The last four digits of the attendee social security number and the attendee CFP board ID are optional fields used in a two out of three check to determine if the individual is a CFP certificate. In addition to a name, the CFP board must be provided with either the certificate CFP board ID or the last four digits of their social security number. If neither of these fields is filled in, the individual will not receive credit. If the last four of the social security number is provided, hyphens will be added by the built-in formatting. Please only provide the last four digits, not the entire number. And if, this, uh, if the last four digits of the social is not provided, leave the field empty. Don't put any other symbols or words in this field as this will also cause a processing error. 
the attendee CFP board ID is, um, if it's provided, leading zeros may be included in the cell but are not necessary. Use of the CFP board ID is the preferred method of identification as some certificates do not have their social security number registered with the CFP board or would not like for this information to be transmitted electronically. Again, if this information is not provided, you may leave this field empty. The attendee last name is the individual's last name and may contain spaces between common prefixes such as Van, D, and Mac. Um, make sure not to include suffixes such as junior, senior, second, third, or fourth, or designations such as CFP or CPA. Use of suffixes or designations will cause the individual not to be recognized by our database, which again could result in a delay in processing time or the individual not, be, not having credit assigned. The attendee first name is the individual's first name and should not contain prefixes such as doctor or captain. The middle name is an optional field. This field should be left blank if no middle name or middle initial is provided. Finally, when submitting a batch report, there are a few steps you can take to ensure accurate and timely processing. Make sure the header row is filled out completely and accurately. Check that the program or programs on the report are registered and active with the CFP board. Make sure that all the dates are filled in and correct. Don't leave any blank rows or spacer rows. And as much as possible, please try to make sure that all of the individuals on the report are CFP certificates. Um, also, please feel free to contact the CE sponsor staff if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. And uh, this is Vanessa again. I'm going to turn our attention to uh, a few topics that I've, I've mentioned before in the presentation, and that is the, uh, the accepted topics. I'll also be talking about topic exclusions, and I'm going to follow that up with a discussion of uh, CFP board's audit function. First, the most important thing that I can say is that topics are key. For us, this is really where the rubber meets the road. As I mentioned, there are 89 topics and an addendum. This information is available online. It's, uh, there's a PDF noted on your, uh, your screen uh, where you can get the information. And also remember that we'll have a PDF of this presentation posted online. So if you don't have time to jot down all of these long URLs, you'll have the reference material shortly. But um, it may sound basic. I, I ask you to refer to the topics list in the addendum before you submit a program application to ensure your session meets topic requirements. We really want to accept all of your programs, but we're not always able to make that connection between your program's content and CFP Board's accepted topics. And, and note that when you're sending a program application and the program is denied because it doesn't meet CFP Board's topics requirements, we're still required to invoice you and bill you for that program application. Um, so because this affects your company or organization financially, and we don't want to make you spend more money than you need to, we ask that you make sure that your applications meet the topic requirements. Um, if we do deny a session because we don't see a connection to topics, and you think that we've made a bad call, feel free to send us more detailed information about the presentation. We have in the past reversed a decision um, based on getting more information from the CE sponsor. Um, but note that if you submit a program application and it's denied, you will still be invoiced for that application. And also remember that uh, if you submit an application for four hours and we only accept two hours because two hours of the session relates to topics, you will be billed for the four hours. Um, we ask that you review this information and that you consider it each and every time that you submit a program application. And also, here's a, 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 an important point as well. Um, as you're submitting your program application and thinking about the topic, think about how the content of your presentation will help the financial planner provide quality services to a client or client, because that's the question that we ask ourselves as we're reviewing your program description. Now I'm going to take a moment to review topic exclusions. These are topics or content specifically identified by CSP Board as not acceptable for continuing education credits, and they account for the bulk of session denials. Um, the subject matter in, the, in this content 
and specifically excluded by CFP board, it's not that CFP board is making a judgment and saying that this is not important information, it's just that it's not currently accepted by CFP board for continuing education credit. And again, in the interest of saving you time and money, when you're submitting a program application, please avoid sending applications uh, based on uh, presentations with content that includes our to topic exclusions. First is practice management. Practice management is the number one topic area for which we are forced to deny a session. And to assist you in understanding CFP Board's perspective, CFP Board developed a definition of practice management. This definition is included in the program application. So going back to the acknowledgement page that you saw earlier when you uh, acknowledge that a program meets CFP Board's criteria, you've agreed that your program does not focus on practice management as defined by CFP Board. I won't read the whole definition, but uh, office management, budgeting, and leadership training are the types of programs that we tend to see in this particular area. Moving on, if the session is focused on sales and covers items such as prospecting, pitching new business, using PowerPoint to your advantage, the session does not meet topic requirements. If the presentation discusses building a financial planner's brand, networking, getting ahead, building a great team, the presentation cannot be accepted for continuing education credit. Again, these are important things to know, but since they're focused on the planner's company and not the client, the subject, the subject are not at this time accepted by CSP board for CE credit. If the presentation focuses on marketing your company and or services or marketing techniques, we cannot accept the session. In regards to succession planning, if the presentation is focused on providing advice to clients about succession planning for their business or businesses, we will accept the presentation. But if the succession planning presentation is for the certificate's knowledge and planning for his or her firm, we cannot accept the presentation. If the program focuses on time management, stress management, nutrition, anti-aging, and the like, we cannot accept the session. All these topics are useful, but they are not topics currently accepted by CFP board. Now I'm going to switch gears to program audits. There is language in the CE sponsor agreement which mentions CFP board's right to audit programs. So all of our CE sponsors agree to the possibility of a program audit when the sponsor first registers with CFP board. And in 2010, CE sponsor staff will be undertaking greater auditing efforts. We have a strong obligation to our certificates to ensure high quality of continuing education options, but we also feel a strong obligation to you, our CE sponsors, to ensure that your fellow CE sponsors are all meeting the same high standards. We don't want one or a few bad apples spoiling the bunch. Generally speaking, though, issues of noncompliance tend to be accidental. Most noncompliance issues pertain to programs which don't meet topics. And from a staff perspective, we'll be more closely monitoring titles for red flag words and phrases. So for example, if a program title includes the word marketing, you could probably expect to get a note from us asking for more information about the presentation. We'll also be reviewing more program descriptions. And as your program applications are being submitted online, members of our team are reading the program descriptions you include with your applications. We're also going to be randomly auditing programs throughout the year. In January of this year, we've already conducted 10 random audits. This is when programs are randomly selected, the CE sponsors contacted for more information about that program, PowerPoint materials, agenda, outline, etc. We conduct a quick review, let the sponsor know uh, whether or not the program is in compliance. Fortunately, so far, all of our random audits have been with programs that are in compliance, but if there is an issue, we'll then work with that sponsor to rectify it. Um, if we have a report of a CE sponsor not being in compliance and feel compelled to conduct an audit, we'll initiate that audit by contacting the CE sponsor by letter, letting them know what the issue or issues are, giving them some time to respond, but ultimately, we really want to work with the CE sponsor to rectify any non-compliance issues. Again, most of the time, these are due to lack of knowledge of topics and, and other program criteria. And uh, if a CE sponsor chooses to not work with us on, a, uh, on an audit, 
if we're not able to come to resolution, ultimately a CE sponsor could be put into an inactive status. Now, moving on, we're going to go into use of CFP words trademarks. I'm going to uh, talk about um, the use of the marks and mention a guide that uh, our legal staff has put together. There's a URL posted on the screen. It's called Guide to Use of the CFP Certification Marks. And in the interest of time today, I've just pulled a few slides that have been given to me by my colleagues in our legal department to share with you. I do ask, though, that you take the time to review the guide for more detailed information. I won't read the entire slide for this next few slides, but this one refers to the use of the marks in printed materials. CFP board provides specific language in the form of taglines which may be used in printed material. There's information for use of the logo and instructions for those times when you might only be able to use text. Here we have trademark, trademark reference information specific to the certification process. It's a disclaimer to be used when printed or electronic materials discuss the certification process. This slide provides information for use of the marks in connection to an institution's education program. In particular, there are a few changes to relate to you about circumstances in which an institution mentions its educational program, references to individual certificates or the certification process, and the tagline that we reviewed a moment ago. This slide provides information specific to program titles. And while this slide provides information in regards to registered programs, which are the collegiate and certificate, certificate programs which are taken by potential certificates in advance of the CFP board exam, this information also applies to CE sponsor usage of the mark. Here we have a couple of do's and don'ts in regards to program title and course numbers that you might publish online or in a course catalog. There's information about email addresses, domain names, and other internet addresses. And again, these handful of slides are meant to just touch on the proper use of the marks. I strongly urge you to review the guide for additional information and detail. And if you ever have any questions about the use of the marks in your particular circumstances, please send an email to trademark at CFP board. Our legal staff will be happy to work with you on an individual basis on your materials. And again, this, this, uh, this email address we'll have posted at the end of our presentation. Now I'm going to move away from legal matters to matters of ethics. And I'm going to take a couple of minutes to talk about our ethics CE sponsors, the program requirements, the application process, and how we conduct our reviews. Um, first, in order for a CE sponsor to offer an ethics focused program, that sponsor must first register to be an ethics CE sponsor. It is a separate registration and it is required if the CE sponsor wants to offer any programming related to CSP board's ethical standards. In regards to the programs themselves, the criteria is pretty simple. The entire program really needs to focus on one aspect or multiple aspects of CSP board's ethical standards. So if you have a two-hour program on CFP board ethics, 50 minutes of, the, uh, of each education hour must focus on CFP board's ethical standards. To break it down, if you're hosting a two-hour presentation on CFP board's ethical standards, 20 minutes of the 120-minute presentation can focus on general ethics information or other information, and 100 minutes needs to focus on CFP board's ethical standards. On the staff side, we review all materials associated with the ethical uh, presentations. This includes PowerPoints, handouts, advertising materials, et cetera. And for that reason, we can only accept ethics program applications um, in hard copy. We're not at this time able to accept online applications. I know that I've run through quite a lot of information. And before we transition to the question and answer period, I wanted to share some contact information with you. These are the uh, email boxes that you can use to reach the CE sponsor staff, uh, the email box with CE reports to submit your batches, and that trademark email address I mentioned a moment ago. Of course, you can always reach us by phone.
And here, as promised, are some web links you may find useful. As I mentioned earlier, we do plan to have a PDF of this PowerPoint presentation posted on CSP Board's website, so you don't need to worry about scrambling to write down all of these URLs. But uh, at this point, I do want to point out, though, that there's one URL which takes you to the information I mentioned about the 2010 CE program policy changes. This might be particularly useful for those of you who were not able to attend our October presentation. And at this point, I'll turn the program back over to Michelle. Thank you, Christy and Vanessa. That is a lot of information, and I'm sure we have some questions from our audience. We'll now transition to the question and answer, answer portion of the program. But before we begin, I do want to let you all know that the CE sponsor team will continue to reach out to CE sponsors. We'll be in touch with ongoing email communications about the CE sponsor program. Now we'll respond to questions. We'll focus on providing answers in general terms to benefit the entire audience. Any questions which are specific to a CE sponsor's particular circumstances will be addressed with that CE sponsor individually, but we'll take the general question theme and respond for the benefit of the full audience. Let's get started. Christy, is there a question which has caught your eye? Um, actually, Michelle, yes, there is. Um, the question is, what's the latest I can submit a batch? Is there a true deadline? And the answer to that question is that we recommend that the sponsors, the CFP board recommends that the sponsors submit the batches within 30 days of the program completion. However, we will accept and process batches anytime they are sent in. The reason for the, recommend, the recommendation of um, 30 days is to benefit the certificates so that the hours are submitted for them as soon as possible in case it impacts the certification period. Okay, and then I've got a question. It says, can the online invoice include the program title and program ID number? And yes, I know that in the first few days of this new process, those, those items were not coming up in the invoices, but that's been rectified, and these items are now reflected in the online invoices. Um, got another question here. Uh, Michelle, I think this one might be best suited for you. It's where does where does the limit come in on the area of client communications and building trust for CE purposes? CFP board's topics addendum outlines communications focused topics which are accepted for CFP board CE credit. The issue we see most is the context in which these communications-related items are discussed in a presentation. In order to be accepted for CFP board credit, the information shared in the program needs to focus on providing the financial planner with communication skills he or she will use to provide quality services to their client. If the communications focused information is in the context of marketing the planner or his or her services, prospecting clients, closing the deal and the like, the program does not meet CFP board's topics requirements. Okay, and then uh, I have a question here that says, why were the CE sponsor program changes made? Most of the changes seem to be related to fees. And uh, this was one that we received quite a few times during our October session, so I thought it worthwhile to address it in this program. And, and basically, our response is that in our ongoing efforts to meet the needs of our certificate and to the general public, CFP board feels that these changes will help us to hold the same rigorous standards that we expect of our certificate to our CE sponsor program. And that we, ho we also, we, we hope that the changes related to the annual submissions and registration will ensure fresh and timely content. Um, further, yes, we know that for some folks, the fees may, uh, may cost them more as they're submitting program applications to CFP board. But uh, with the fee changes, we feel that those changes will help CFP board increase the quality of our services to our CE sponsors and to certificates. We're hoping that these changes will allow us to make more use of technology, conduct more outreach to our CE sponsors, 
and help with our increased auditing efforts. Um, I will also point out that we did solicit input from CFP board, volunteer council and education, which is a seven member, seven member volunteer group that's composed of certificates and academia, and they spoke to us in depth about these program policy changes. Uh, Michelle, was there a question that caught your eye? That a question, is there a discount or reduced fee for nonprofits? Yes, the answer is yes. Nonprofit status. This is defined as the tax exempt status granted by the government. If you're a nonprofit, contact us via email at the CE sponsor email box and provide the government issued documentation of tax exempt status. On a side note, that's usually the IRS letter that provides. Um, of their the tax exempt status and we'll then update your record and all future applications and annual registrations will be issued under that nonprofit status. So it's important that you provide us the documentation on a one time basis. We will update your file and then you'll be able to benefit from that status. Okay, and then I see uh, we've got a question that came in earlier. It says, are conferences the same as programs to you? And, and pretty much yes. What we're saying is that each indiv individual session that a CE sponsor wants to present needs to be submitted to CFP board as a separate program application. And, and basically what this allows you to do is that uh, once that session is accepted, you can offer it over and over and over and over throughout the year. And even if it is part of a, a conference that you're holding on one particular date, you can pull out a, a, a session or two and offer them again as part of another conference rather than having to submit separate conference applications for each time you host a presentation. Um, so for the purposes of our application process, yes, we're, we're identifying conference sessions in the same way as individual one-off types of presentations. Um, Michelle, Christy, was there a, a question that uh, caught your eye? Christy, can you scroll down a little bit? Sure. Um, there's a question that says, in Vanessa's example of three two-hour sessions within a six-hour conference, if each program requires a separate application, does this mean that these three sessions will each cost the $25 application fee for a total of $75 for the conference? So if, yes, if it's a for-profit company that is submitting a program application, um, for three conference sessions, they would be three individual program applications at $25 per application. So if it's three applications and $25 to pop, it does come out to $75 for what you would consider to be um, your conference application. Um, then I see a follow-up. Uh, do you have any tips for insertion of an outline in the program approval page, running into issues with the character limitations um, again, we have now uh, increased the number to 400 characters, and you don't need to submit an entire um, outline. We really just want an overview of what the content of that presentation is going to be. So whatever works best for you in that, pre that program description field, if it's an outline, an agenda that's condensed, or a narrative of what's going to be discussed in that particular presentation, uh, that's fine for us. Um, let's see. Um, I just saw one, Vanessa. Um, what is the program ID? Um, this is an ID that you identify your program with when you submit the program application online. It can be any ID that would work for your own company or organization. Okay. Um, I see one that if you don't have a URL with the material for the conference, how do you submit the presentation or information for that conference? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, so I'll answer it as best as I can. And if I'm off the mark, please send an updated note and, and we'll try to respond to that. But you're not required to submit a URL for your particular conference when you submit your session applications. Um, we just need the, the date, location, program description type of information, but you're not required to provide us with a web URL to, re to direct people to. I know in that program offerings uh, uh, page that there is that option. 
um, but it's not something that is absolutely required. You're able to add date and location information in that program offering field without providing a specific conference URL. Um, Follow-up, a really quick one, there's a, can we still send paper applications? The answer to this is yes. You absolutely can, but understand that if you submit a paper application, that there's a manual processing fee that you will incur per application, and that's $25 per application. And so in the interest of trying to save you money and to be more sustainable, we would hope that you would try to use the online application process. But if that's completely not an option for you, um, paper applications are still accepted. Michelle, Christy, did you see anything? Um, there's one here, what is the cost per topic hour now? The cost per, to the cost per hour, it's um, on an hourly basis. There's no longer a flat fee for um, program applications. And the fee is, if you're a for-profit company, it's $25 per hour. If you are a nonprofit entity, it's $10 per hour. And this is where that reminder that Michelle offered earlier for you nonprofits really comes into play, because we do have a number of, of uh, sponsors who we suspect are nonprofits, but who, when they initially registered, did not uh, indicate as much and have not provided us with confirmation of their tax-exempt status. We're happy to update those records. Uh, but again, it's $25 per hour for a for-profit and $10 per hour for a nonprofit. Um, the next question that came up is, what are the requirements for online self-study tests? An example is how many questions are required for one CE credit and how much study material is required for one CE credit. Um, basically, the CFP board has a policy that there is a minimum of 10 questions per CE hour offered. Um, the study material is something that it should, I don't know, Vanessa, you, you want to go with the study material? Um, Michelle, you can chime in if you like, but I think there's, there's language that's in the agreement that talks about the CE sponsor having to make a judgment as to how much time they feel a, an individual requires to complete the program. And, but in addition to that, this test requirement is um, at least 10 test questions per hour of continuing education credit provided. Um, I, I'm getting a signal that we're, we're running close to the end of time, so we'll try and address a couple of really quick ones. But just a reminder to you in the audience that if you didn't hear your question um, as we're speaking now, that we will put together a written outline of the questions and responses and post that to CFP Board's website. Um, one quick one I see is, uh, is in regards to the seven business day turnaround time for application reviews. Um, what happens if we haven't heard from you in seven days? Uh, are we notified if a session has been denied? Um, our expectation is that the CE sponsor will have an email uh, uh, notification from us in regards to their program application. And certainly, if a, a session is denied, you will get an email from us telling you that that uh, session has been denied um, and with a reason for the denial. Um, at this time, let's see, again, a, a reminder I see, can we please get the PowerPoint? Just a reminder, we will post that online so that everybody can, can download the slides. Um, let's see, if we use an approved ethics program from a provider as part of our CE program, do we have to reapply with the material? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but if a CE sponsor wants to host an ethics CE program focused on CFP Board's ethical standards, that CE sponsor needs to register with CFP Board to become an ethics sponsor, and then they would need to submit any uh, program materials with an application to CFP Board for review and approval. I hope that answers the question. If not, please uh, send a follow-up note, and uh, we'll provide a more detailed response. So at this point, um, I think, Michelle, did you have any closing comments? <coughs> Just, I wanted to thank everyone again for participating in today's webinar and your interest and ongoing uh, support to continue to be a continuing education sponsor. 
as we said throughout the program, our goal is to ensure that the programs you submit are accepted and that they are high quality programs ultimately to help deliver our mission and ensure that the public is protected by competent um, financial planning advice. We will continue to communicate with you. We are here to provide service to you and we are trying uh, to continue to encourage CFP professionals to take programs that have been pre-approved so that they do not um, receive, attend programs that are not the high quality and rigorous review that we have assured them. So thank you again for attending today's seminar, and we hope to hear from you again in the near future. Have a great day.